Sex is some boring subject. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Hey, welcome. That's my cue. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. This is episode, I, man, I think we're up to 370 by now. Recorded on September 17th, 2019. My name is Chris Spangle. We're going to continue our look at uh, the state of policing in America. And we're going to talk about civil asset forfeiture tonight. So stay tuned. It's going to be a great show. Ryan Holt is here. Trisha Stewart from Ginger Archie is here. And uh, we'll continue the conversation right after this warning. Warning. This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Hey, everybody. My name is Chris Spangle, and I'm so excited to be here this week. Uh, three shows in a week. I'm spoiling you all. It's like it's 2017 around here. Uh, so we had a great conversation with Rob Cortell. If you haven't listened to The Swamp Explained, please do. There's Separate feed if you want to get caught up for that. And Rob asked me to tell you, hey, go follow him on Twitter at Rob Cortell and find that in the show notes of last week's episode. There's a lot going on with the Jones Act. Uh, so be sure to uh, go check that out. Uh, I will be in Texas this next week, um, the week of the 23rd, 24th or whatever for a few days. So if you're, uh, if you're in Texas, I'll be down there for the uh, national radio show, the NAB. So um, I'm taking, I'll be there Friday. I'm taking an extra day and just to kind of explore Dallas. So if you're around Friday evening and want to get together, then hit me up in the DMS on Facebook and uh, maybe we can uh, arrange something for all you Texas peeps going to get to see the great Jason Doolittle, one of my favorite people on the planet. He lives there in the area. And so we're going to go uh, out to eat and I'm going to solve the Kennedy assassination. So honestly, I've got a big week ahead of me. So, uh, but we, we will not be here next week, but uh, hopefully with these three episodes, we're getting you through. Uh, Harry is out sick tonight. He had a tickle in his throat, he said. He said, I, I, uh, I forget what he said. He said a sore throat. So uh, we don't know if he's joining us. I sent him the link just in case his throat tickle cleared up. But uh, staging a coup uh, of the co-host position is Reinhold. Reinhold, how are you doing? Well, you should turn your mic on there. Now you've automatically disqualified. I have. Man, you, this was quite lost. a. This was quite the. I'm coup. trying to keep up to the professionalism <laughs> we have here, and we maintain for everybody. <laughs> I, no. To be fair, I turned your mic off when you went to get water. What, so. what I what I don't understand, and I'm trying to figure out, is what it is that Harry complains about because I'm burning up. It's hot in here. It's hot in here. I don't know what's going it's on. It's 66 degrees and I'm oh. sweating too. So maybe it's two shirts. And I just, I don't, I don't <laughs> think I can do it. I'm going to have to, I'm going to be sweating by the end of this thing. Uh, on zoom live, uh, from wherever the hell she lives. Uh, oh. Trisha Stewart is with us. How are you doing? I'm doing well. And my feelings are really hurt. Thank you. You live near the great lakes. I don't want to say exactly where you live because I don't want people stalking you. It's already happened. But honestly, <laughs> I know. Yes. Um, <laughs> Trisha is, uh, I believe the people on the internet call you a cutie with a booty and they slide in your DMs and uh, get mad that you don't respond to them within five minutes of receiving the message. Yes, that is true. So uh, once again, we would have read you some of those messages, but I failed to prepare. So. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> yep. <it's, laughs> I'll take the blame on this one. Um, yeah, so it is great. And there, while you're subscribing to the Swamp Explain, make sure that you check out uh, Libertarian Politics and Policy. That's where Dennis posts episodes, Ginger Archie, where Trisha posts episodes. You got some good stuff coming up, don't you? Oh, yes. I have some really cool names and interviews coming up. And then I think we're going to load up some other stuff that people haven't heard, which is um, very funny. Some Some good humor there, so... Very good. So we're very excited for that, and we're uh, excited to have you both here. Um, man, I was going to – I didn't even really think of anything. I've just been thinking so much about the topic that we've been uh, talking about. Uh, we, we didn't get a lot of hate. I, I don't know if you guys got any hate for the episode, but 
I was surprised, and maybe our audience has just gone full off the deep end libertarian along with us, uh, that I didn't get more hate for the policing the police episode. I, I did uh, get a few, hey, there are people out there like my good friend Todd McComas of uh, the Pat McAfee organization who has been out there using comedy trying to humanize police officers um, and explain the job from. And so I, I did get one piece of hate on that end. I don't know if you guys got any, but for the most part, I got a lot of people saying, uh, yeah, I felt that that was a good episode that kind of challenged the power of the police. And if you haven't listened to part one, please go listen to that right now. But I, I don't think we were really too hard on the police as much as we were at the institution itself. I right. Mean, we Trisha, talked about how Trisha, he said hard on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got to do it. <laughs> no. Set him up. Sorry, sorry, thank you. But no, we, we really were pretty, we, we tried to make sure that we, everyone understood that we were coming from a place where we know that most police officers are, are really out there just trying to do what they think right. is best and trying to help the community. And um, it's just the power structure and the systems and the, um, the upper management with rules and regulations and nobody really having a check on the police is where the issue kind of falls apart. I don't, yeah, I've been watching Cold Case, and I know that TV shows are usually not your best uh, judge of it, but it's not a it's a documentary A and E type show, and it's mm-hmm. basically these police detectives that usually the second generation of detectives picks up a cold case and works it, and you see the efforts and the lengths that these detectives go through to try and solve these crimes, and it is really amazing, and the police work is really good, and they're they're trying to do what's right and put actual bad guys that committed murder in jail and solve. You know, and, and you watch that and you go, there are good cops in the world. There are good people trying to do the work the right way. You know, but I do think that it, you, you can, two things can be true at once. There can be good police officers who are trying to do good work, who are trying to make a difference in a positive way in the world. But then there also can be the same truth that the industry is largely becoming militarized. And that's a problem for a myriad of reasons, as, as we outlined. And it's the, the idea that we are asking the police to solve every societal ill. And at the end of the day, that really is what the message of these two episodes that we're trying to get across to people that hopefully you walked away with in that last episode is that politicians and the public that votes them in are asking police officers to solve every problem that we have in society. We're asking police officers to do too much. Because at the end of the day, the, the laws of uh, – you see to serve and protect, started by the LAPD. Uh, they're there to serve and protect the laws of the, of the commonwealth or the state or the jurisdiction that signs their paycheck. And so when we turn to the government and we turn to force, essentially, to solve every problem in society, you know, from child hunger to – um, to making you buy insurance, to every every problem has uh, that we solve through a law ends up being enforced by the police. And so when we ask the government to do too much, we shouldn't be surprised that the overtaxed police departments start looking. It's it's a set of perverse incentives, Tricia. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, I'm going to just, can I just say something about what you guys just said? Yeah. Um, I, as far as, um, you know, not criticizing and that there are good police officers out there, I understand that there are people that took that position um, and thought they were doing good and serving and protecting. And then, again, I've, I've seen that show, Chris, and I, I do believe that, um, especially detectives, happen to be a little more intellectual than I would say the average beat cop uh, as far as uh, they want to solve a crime and, and, and find somebody that's actually committed a real crime. But... In the end, it's the monopoly on force that is the issue with the police uh, because the government uses them. So there's no competition and there's a monopoly on force and therein lies every issue. You could tie everything back to that. There's no checks and balances. They are people that hold a position of power and hold uh, for some people, you know, career or whatever, not through any type of, um, they don't have to be good at what they do. Police mm-hmm. don't get fired. Uh, they just have to do what the politicians tell them to do. The worst, the, the worst part of 
policing is the monopoly. Obviously, in any society, you would need security. Uh, you know what I mean? You need people to find people that commit crimes and arrest them or prevent them or whatever. But uh, no matter how libertarian your society is, there's going to be a show like Cold Case where there are two psychopaths that rape and kill a girl. I mean, there. That's human nature. I mean, at its very basis nature, there will always be a, a small percentage of the human animal that behaves that way. And no matter how libertarian and utopian you'd like it to be, there will always be bad actors. There will people be people who commit fraud. Uh, yes. And so there's always going to be a need for security. And I think sometimes people think a libertarian society, of the, when, when we say we don't like police, we're not saying there should be no security. There should be no right. police. We're saying there should be no monopoly because just as conservatives will say, uh, bad teachers should be allowed to be fired. They mm -hmm. don't deserve tenure. They won't make that same argument about the police. And l the left, Democrats, will often say bad police need fired, but then they will say, but, but not firing the bad teachers. Bad. So what libertarians are saying is like, no, let's, let's not have the monopoly that creates the incentive to keep bad police or that mm -hmm. protects its own because there is only one option. And that's kind of what you're saying is that there should be security and there will be security in a libertarian society. It just won't be monopolized with one single institution doing the policing. Yes. And through violent funded through violent coercion and, and there's nowhere else to go. Explain uh, violent it, coercion. So violent coercion, um, so for some of you that are maybe new to libertarianism, uh, libertarianism basically, in my opinion, which is always right, is we reject the initiation of violence. Okay. That doesn't mean that some people don't deserve uh, violence against them if they predicate it. Or if, it, you know, if they initiate violence, you can defend yourself. What, it, what that can relate to in every topic of libertarianism, and then especially the police, is that I have not hurt you, I have not stolen your property, and yet in the same time, you could actually lock me in a cage, murder me, and I have not done those things. Therefore, you're initiating violence. It's a very simple principle. Um, and if, if you start to understand it, you could weave it through every part of your life. So cops right now have a monopoly, which... In, in essence, they are initiating violence. Now, if you could choose between people and you could choose to live in a society uh, where uh, you had a security force that you wanted to protect you from certain things, but say, uh, you know, you had a tail light out, they couldn't pull you over for that because there's no victim to that crime, unless you signed a contract and saying, I will drive on this road, making sure that, you know, my signals and lights work correctly. Um, what happens, and this just goes to praxology, uh, when you have a monopoly, then it's, it's, not, it's not a desirable outcome. It's, it's what the state or the people in power want. Um, it, it's not what the consumers want. And we are consumers. And if we, if we were able to dictate what security was able to do, that doesn't mean they're not going to be here. That just means that, you know, most people wouldn't uh, sign a contract where somebody could pull them over for a taillight and tase them. Like, mm -hmm. that's just not, that's not what human beings would do. And it's kind of weird, to be honest. But, um, but I would argue that we have done that. Because we're the ones who authorize the police to do this. We, we're the ones authorized the politicians to put these people in place, to put these rules in place and laws in place. And these things are happening around us and we're not fighting back as a, a majority of society and making the change that needs to be made. So would well, it, you're saying voting is consent to everything that happens. And that's just quite patently false. <laughs> I'm not saying voting is consent. I'm saying, then how did I, how did I do that? I'm not saying you did it. I'm saying the, the majority of people. When you go on it. Facebook, for example, when you go on Facebook and say, this woman shouldn't have been tased for having a taillight out. The amount of people that are tell defending. you you're an idiot. Yeah, they're defending. I mean, people are begging for more government a lot of times. Yeah. They're begging Currently, for right government now, solutions. That's what's going on. Yeah. And, that, and, and there's a lot of us who are out there, libertarians and other um, like-minded people who are out there saying this isn't right and we shouldn't be allowed to do this. But at the, at the end of the day, the majority of people voting for this stuff want this apparently, which is mind-boggling to me. I don't understand why they do. 
I know exactly why. I think it's propaganda and mm-hmm. weird mindset where they think that they're so scared of something and they don't know what it is. So they're just kind of glomming that fear onto everything. And, and that's how it's kind of happening. But I think more logical and, and um, evidence-based examination of this, people would have a different view on it. Mm-hmm. And I would like to get us there regardless of whether we do it in the current society or we get to a libertarian society and do it either way. I, I just, I would like to see the people stand up and say, no, we're not going to do this anymore. We're not going to allow this anymore and have, have the majority of people actually make that difference. Right. A uh, happy constitution day, Trisha. <laughs> oh my God. I had my morning constitutional and thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Um, <laughs> It was so funny because at some point last week, uh, Dennis is like, uh, I, I want to make a joke, but I don't know Trisha very well. I'm like, let it fly, buddy. Let it. Oh, be- baby. Bring it on, Dennis. Uh, so let's, <laughs> let's jump back into our great show notes by Sam Schultz. Uh, as we kind of continue talking about the evolution of policing, uh, we, we talked a lot at the end about the militarization of the police and no-knock raids and the erosion of the Fourth Amendment. And I wanted to open this week's episode uh, kind of examining how law has uh, evolved in America, but really across the board, uh, regarding these no-knock raids and and privacy and the Fourth Amendment issues. Um, So let's give it a historical timeline. And as always, both of you, if you want to jump in and give some uh, more detail, please do. So in 1604, in English common law, the Castle Doctrine, protected residents from unannounced government intrusion. And that basically the Castle Doctrine says in in common law is just widely accepted law, right? So if uh, two people are living together, you don't need to pass any laws. It just says that if, uh, you know, uh, if Trisha and her boyfriend are living together, the government doesn't need to um, put any kind of... um, stamp of approval on it they've lived together for 10 years so they're common it's called a common law marriage it's probably where most of you hear the term common law but it just the the general pattern of human behavior and accepted law is what common law is and the castle doctrine is part of that and that basically is every man's home is their or woman's home is their castle that your property is your property Uh, and that really became uh, enshrined in, in the early 1600s. Now, in 1791, the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution banned unreasonable searches and seizures. Uh, and in 1914, in Weeks versus the United States, now, Dennis, you know all good things. When I say 1914, surely you're about to get some rights taken away. Because when 1912, 13, 14 starts popping up in a timeline of historical events, you know it's about to be good. It was an ugly time. Yes. And so in 1914, Weeks versus the United States uh, was passed by the Supreme Court, passed or decided on by the Supreme Court. And it says evidence from illegal searches must be excluded from trials. So that was actually a good protection. Uh, In 1958, in Miller versus the United States, the court said prior notice is required before police can force entry. In 1995, Wilson versus Arkansas, or Arkansas, if you're uneducated, the court said police don't need to knock if there is a risk of danger or destruction of evidence. So if they have reason to believe that you're flushing the cocaine down while, you know, shooting babies in the face, then they can just knock which, the door down. Which comes out of the drug war. If it wasn't for right. the drug war and people worried about flushing drugs down a toilet, right? that never would have had an issue. I never would have been in there. Did you, and you see that in police procedures. I don't know if this happens in real life, but you're like, did you hear a baby, uh, a woman screaming or a baby? Like, and then they knock the door down. Uh, in 1997, in Richards v. Wisconsin, the courts concluded that only reasonable suspicion of danger or evidence destruction is needed to force entry. So uh, that only reasonable suspicion of danger or evidence destruction is needed to force entry. So that erodes your Fourth Amendment and the Castle Doctrine. And in 2003, the U.S. versus Banks, the courts ruled that police can force entry 15 seconds after knocking. So it went from, uh, well, you don't need to knock if there's a risk. And then if you have a reasonable suspicion, then you can do whatever you want. And then 
Yeah, but give it 15 seconds. Well, and that's what they've done is they've taken the word in the original amendment that says unreasonable search and seizures right. and saying, no, that's reasonable that, you know, we, we have to allow them to go in and do that. But I don't know if that's really what they were trying to say when they were saying unreasonable search and seizure. I think at the time they were saying um, much, much more narrow right. of, a, of a definition of that uh, reasonableness. Um, so, so that's the problem I always had with a lot of these laws and, and decisions is what's, who's defining reasonable at the time. And, that, right. and that, that changes throughout society. And that's why we end up with this living document where people just start putting their own spin on things. And the other thing too is common law is used to determine some Supreme Court decision. Mm. I mean, they, they do take common law into account. So that also changes throughout society. Right. So you can see where the trend has been going right over the past yeah. 100 years common law generally accepted laws over the course of human history the development from the roman empire on the grecian sure. empire um all right so after a series of rulings in the 90s officers were able to obtain a warrant to forcibly enter a house with merely a quote reasonable suspicion that announcing would be dangerous or allow the destruction of evidence Paradoxically, that standard allowed the use of the most extreme force in pursuit of the smallest amounts of drugs, since a few grams or more are quickly flushed than a few bales. Uh, in a 2003 support, the Supreme Court affirmed the right of officers to break into a residence with a standard warrant after knocking and waiting only 15 to 20 seconds. Three years later, it undercut even that requirement by concluding that evidence remains admissible even when the police barge in more quickly. So you didn't you didn't need special circumstance. Now it's literally just barge in if you want, and if you're under that 15 seconds, eh, so be it. So thir 13 states have enacted laws authorizing no knock warrants altogether. Another 13 have blessed them through rulings by appellate courts. In seven states, no knock warrants are routinely granted in the absence of explicit authority by statute or the courts. In the 16 states and the District of Columbia. No knock warrants are not customarily are not customary, but the police can nonetheless make unannounced entries with standard warrants. Oregon is the only state with a law requiring the police to always announce themselves before or before serving a search warrant. Excuse me. So why do you think that we see um, the Fourth Amendment being eroded? What, what, because to me, the idea that a person's private property is uh, sacred, it's a uh, you know, generations of human beings fought up until 1604 to get that right, to establish that right. Uh, and then we, over the course of the last 100 years, have been trying to erode that right. I mean, mm -hmm. is it just human nature to, to let this stuff go, to allow our neighbors to get their doors broken into, thinking it'll never happen to us? Trish, you want to? I, I, yeah, I, I want to say, uh, to that point, uh, what has happened is that if you really truly think about what police officers are because they have a monopoly because they're agents of the government they're arm, arms of politicians and so if you look at the way that government has intruded in our lives it, it, you know it, government only grows itself so government has grown and they need their enforcers and so i mean it's it's pretty simple um politicians speak and the enforcer, enforcers listen which happen to be cops in this instance and uh, we see uh, more laws and less freedom and less liberty as time goes on. And then I, I often think there was a turning point um, in uh, our country, and that would be the 2002 Authorization Act, uh, Patriot Act. Uh, I think that that was probably one of the biggest turning points in our time when people stopped worrying about liberty and accepted everything the government told them and the enforcers, which would be the police locally, um, they uh, they gave up their liberty for them. And um, yeah, I, I blame the boomers because those people who yeah. fought in the streets, the hippies like uh, Reinhold here, who fought you know for an expansion of liberty in many areas. Yeah, 11 happened. We talked a lot with that about with Rob Cortell in the last episode. Um, we just let a lot of things go after 9-11. Mm -hmm. You had the yes. Patriot Act. You had massive data collection. You have the unauthorized use of military force, the AUMF, as you just articulated. Mm -hmm. You had the, T the creation of the TSA and the Homeland Security Department. You have so many massive erosions 
and nobody fought back in the 90s when you had these little testing cases. And again, it goes back to people basically begging for it. I mean, we have to, if you don't want these rights to be eroded, like the Second Amendment, if you don't want the Second Amendment to be eroded, you better stand up. You better be courageous in your speech and explain why you, your rights are non-negotiable. And you have to do it for all rights. You can't just do it for the one you like. Yeah, and the, yeah, it's the funny thing I noticed is that the American people were going to say, we're not going to let this terrorism change us. We're not going to let what happened on 9-11 change us. It completely did. I mean, they, you, can they argue, won. you can argue that bin Laden, if yeah. you go back and read bin Laden in the 80s and 90s, he won. He yeah, got everything. Yep. He to do. And it started in yep. 93 when they bombed the World Trade Center the first time. Right. That's when everything started kind of slowly going, a little test casing going on. Uh, civil, civil asset forfeiture, forfeiture got applied to mobsters only. Uh, you know, and, and then that was used as the basis for the Patriot Act yeah. once 9-11 happened. So we you know, talk a good game about how we're not going to let these other countries and what they do to us change our basic belief system. But it totally did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I think that the Patriot Act was the tipping point, which was inevitable. And obviously, uh, philosophically, as an anarchist, I know that the state only grows. And there's a point uh, when you, even like a, like a minarchist society, loses liberty. That was the point for me. When people accepted complete violation of privacy, um, and, and they all didn't just accept it, they worshipped it almost. Uh, they there was such patriotism and, and such fear uh, of what would come. And so they gave up their rights very willingly, which is really quite brilliant if you think of it um, in terms of what the state perpetuated in the propaganda. I think That's that so was the point. That was the point we couldn't go back from. And mm-hmm. we can't go back from that, to but be honest. James Madison warned against that exact thing happening. Yeah. Right? It's not like we, we haven't seen this coming for years. I mean, Madison said that our rights are going to be lost for fear of other p- other countries and war and stuff like that. Right. It, exactly what he said was going to happen, happened. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that entangling alliances and all that good stuff. Uh, so, <laughs> brilliant analysis on my part. Let's jump to <laughs> civil asset forfeiture. Uh, civil asset forfeiture originated in the British fight against piracy on the open seas. Uh, back in the, you know, the old pirate days. It continued during Prohibition with police officers seizing goods, cash, and equipment from bootleggers in a similar manner to today. The war on drugs, however, is the biggest cause of contemporary civil asset forfeiture. Uh, Now, do either of you want to kind of give us a a loose definition of exactly what that means? Well, originally it was supposed to be, let's, people were upset that they they would, um, arrest this person for something. It was either a mobster or, or a, a big drug dealer. Right. And they would be able to go out and buy the best attorneys and they would go all these loopholes. They would get themselves off and they wanted to crack down on that. So the idea was that you take all their stuff from them when you arrest them so that they can't go out and buy the best attorneys. And then they have mm-hmm. to do with like what anybody else would do. And they would get a fair right. trial that way. But, in my opinion is that they are now taking property from somebody without proving that that person is guilty of a crime, right? Which only hurts. And it's always going to expand and it expanded on to just everyday people and people who don't have a lot of money and they're taking every, every cent from them basically that they have, there's no way they can even mount a basic defense at that point. Yeah. As, as we go through this, think about red flag laws. Seems like a good idea in the beginning, and I, at one point on the show, was like, you know, this red flag law where you confiscate a, a reported crazy person's guns, you know, that that seems like it might work. That might be a solution. And then the more you, like, sit and think about it, the more you talk with other people about it, you go, the abuses in 25 years were going to be sitting back going, how did this happen? Why are we allowing this? And nobody cares, just like they don't care about civil asset forfeiture. Well, it's just like the, red, the problem with the red uh, flag laws is that if somebody is too dangerous to own a gun, they're too dangerous to own a car or a knife right. or bomb mm-hmm. materials right. or access to the library or the internet in order to learn all this stuff. I mean, right. you take that person out of society if they're that far gone. Otherwise, it's used to 
basically take the guns away from any person who has gone in for any kind of mental issue at all because they can then be marked as, you know, crazy. Right. And nobody goes in to get help anymore. The idea that we're going to uh, that Trump is floating this Donald Trump, your Republican president, is floating the idea of using Alexa and your Apple Watch to basically uh, signal that this person's crazy. Well, you have one fight with your wife or husband, and then mm-hmm. you're March, and then the red flag laws yeah. are, are or you, you, you got your phone sitting there next to you while you're watching a movie, and the person on the TV says, "I right. want to kill you," and they're right. like, "Bing, oh, go to the police come." Right. I mean, that's and, insanity. That is completely insane. When we're complete, when we're collecting literally every electronic signal in the entire universe at this, mm-hmm. point, basically in Utah, through the NSA, like there's the metadata you, for the win. The way <laughs> that you build a case is that you have a working theory, and then you go and find the evidence to support your theory. And when you've collected everything on everyone in all time, and it's accessible in an easy to use database, uh, then then it's pretty easy. So, jumping back into civil asset forfeiture. Uh, It really entered a new phase in 1984 under the Comprehensive Crime Control Act championed by Ronald Reagan. It allowed for police agencies to keep the assets they seized. This highly incentivized the seizure of assets for the purpose of funding police departments rather than pursuing criminal charges. However, the game changed completely in 1996, the year of the landmark Supreme Court decision, Bennis versus Michigan. This ruling held that the innocent owner of uh, the the innocent owner uh, defense was not sufficient to recover asset seized during civil asset forfeiture. So I read that confusingly. So basically, the, <laughs> I'm innocent. You can't you have, charge me. But you have been you have been you've gone through a court of law and they have found that you were there's not enough evidence to prove you guilty. Right. Not technically not, not, innocent. Not that yeah. you're innocent, right, right? That you didn't do it, but that they can't charge you. Right. They still can keep your stuff. So in 1986, as Nancy Reagan encouraged America's youth to, quote, just say no, the Justice Department started the Asset Forfeiture Fund. This sparked a boom in civil asset forfeiture that now has become self-reinforcing. As the criminalization of American life and asset forfeiture has continued to essentially feed each other. In 2014 alone, law enforcement took more stuff from American citizens than burglars did. And and let me say, you can go look at the source in our show notes in our in our link. In 2014 alone, law enforcement took more stuff from American citizens than burglars did. Mm-hmm. In 2014, the total amount of civil asset forfeiture seizures in the United States was 4.5 billion. The Jeez. total the total value of property stolen in burglaries was 3.9 billion. The total amount stolen was 4.5 plus 3.9 billion in theft. Uh, so, criminal asset forfeiture versus civil asset forfeiture. There's a difference. The primary difference is that criminal asset forfeiture requires a conviction, while civil asset forfeiture doesn't. Civil asset forfeiture is a lawsuit against the seized object in question rather than a person. They will sue your car, they will sue your cash, they will sue your dog if they haven't shot it. Uh, the legal burden of proof varies from one state to another, but the most common is preponderance of evidence, not reasonable doubt. Th- so you may remember that from your civil, civil studies or whatever you called it in your high school. In a civil case, it's just the preponderance of the evidence. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt as in a criminal case. Uh, so essentially, it means if juries decide that the state's case is more likely to be true than not, 51 to 49%, not beyond a reasonable doubt, 100%. In a civil asset forfeiture trial, courts can weigh the use of the Fifth Amendment. This is not true in criminal trials. Uh, The burden of proof question becomes crucial when it comes to retrieving property. In criminal cases, assets are returned if the prosecution fails to prove the guilt of the accused. In a civil asset forfeiture trial, the accused effectively has to prove their innocence to get their property back. Thus, civil asset forfeiture is a highly attractive option for police departments looking to scare up extra scratch in tight budgetary times. What's more, the accused is not entitled to legal counsel. This is why, in most cases, it is not economically advantageous to try and get one's property back. The lawyer fees will quickly eclipse whatever the value of the seized assets have. Now, civil asset forfeiture has exploded since 86 when the total seizures were $93.7 million. By 2005, that passed the $1 billion mark. 
That was double the 2004 amount of 597 million. By 2010, this figure jumped to 2.5 billion with more than 15,000 forfeiture cases, 11,000 of which were civil, not criminal. And one thing to note in all of that, in all that time where we've gone increase in the civil uh, asset forfeiture, crime has been dropping like a stone. Right. Exactly right. Um, cash seizures in Tennessee have gotten so widespread that the state legislature has begun to investigate it. They're like, wait, we're stealing too much money. We better look into this. They're going to catch on to us sooner or later. You got to protect our phony baloney jobs. <laughs> right. I didn't <laughs> jump out of that guy. Uh, traffic stops have turned into shakedown operations. Interstate, mm -hmm. Interstate 40 was described as a, quote, major profit center by Phil Williams, a reporter for Channel 5 in Nashville. Much like gangs, police in Tennessee have started engaging in turf warfare over the spoils of civil asset forfeiture. The Dixon Interdiction Enforcement, or DICE, and the 23rd Judicial District Drug Task Force were caught on video trying to cut one another off in their vehicles to stop civilians and search for cash. The head of DICE admitted that it was funded entirely by civil asset forfeiture in cash. In Tennessee, officers were set up to set up a post to bust drug traffickers on a known highway used for muling drugs from Mexico into the United States. However, their post was not set up to stop the flow of drugs into the United States, which one would think the ostensibly to be the goal of the, United, the war on drugs. Instead, the post was set up to bust cars bound for Mexico that might be carrying cash, a far more valuable commodity for police departments. So they weren't setting up stings for drugs entering the country. They were setting up stings for cash leaving the country. Yes, it's harder for them to get the cash out of the drugs. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, they, they have to just, you know, steal that under their vest and sell it on their own time like um, normal, well, normal criminals do. I, I know this kid, uh, Miss Prangle, who went to, uh, who went to high school in, in, in his hometown, the hometown cops would uh, bust kids with their weed and sell it right back to them. Uh, and then would also go raid the, uh, uh, the closet for all the evidence that they had confiscated on that night and then go sell it to kids uh, to make extra cash. I don't know where he got his information, but I, I know he remembers that clearly. A um, 1994 study found that police delayed drug bust to increase the value of forfeiture. A 2001 study of 1,400 police departments published in the Journal of Criminal Justice, uh, so it's in a journal, big sample size, found that half of the departments surveyed agreed that civil asset forfeiture was, quote, necessary as a budget supplement. And the 2004 report showed that police departures keep wish lists for items they obtain via civil asset forfeiture, just like fat podcasters who have a link on their website at wearelibertarians.com. They have wish lists. Yeah, you want that fishing, <laughs> right? right? So that you can buy yeah. it the auction. Yes, exactly right. So it, it is often applied to crimes like DWI or yeah. violating the National Halibut Fishing Act. In, in the 85% of all cases, no one is ever charged of a crime. In 94% of California seizures in 2013, they were for 5,000 or less, but the average DEA seizure in 1998 was $25,000. So in 1998, they averaged uh, uh, 25000 in cash. It was down to 5000 in 2013. Uh, precisely the cap on what attorneys advise against trying to reclaim due to the legal fees and court costs. So basically, if you have anything seized under $25,000, like your car, um, and disproportionately the poor are affected by uh, drugs, uh, drug busts, ha home invasions, cash mm -hmm. theft. Um, they have absolutely no ability to get their property back. So 88% of Department of Justice seizures are administrative, meaning that they were never challenged in court, likely due to the high cost and risk associated with challenging a seizure. Or not even being notified correctly of right. when the auction was going to be taking place and everything else. United States courts have repeatedly ruled that simply having a large amount of cash on hand is, quote, strong evidence, end quote, of criminal wrongdoing, in particular drug trafficking. Then it's up to you to prove that you didn't get the money from drug trafficking. The Patriot Act created a new crime called bulk cash smuggling, which expands hmm. the scope of civil asset forfeiture. So 
if you, let's say your grandma has $80,000 in cash hidden in her house, you better get that, that to a bank and make sure that it's counted in the federal system or else. Or, well, you also have to make sure you do it in less than $9,999. Yes. Any transaction That's right. or you're going to get in trouble. Equitable sharing is a process allowing police organizations to circumvent existing laws, and it makes money for both the federal government and local police departments. This process further incentivizes civil asset forfeiture as a means of funding local police departments at the federal, state, and local levels. With equitable sharing, state and local law enforcement turn assets over to federal authorities for federal crimes. The feds then return up to 80% of the assets back from whence it came. This effectively allows state and local authorities to circumvent relevant local laws by bringing in the feds. For example, in Missouri, seized money is supposed to go to the schools. When equitable sharing is used, nothing goes to the schools. So fuck those kids. Mm-hmm. From 2000 to 2013, equitable sharing payments to states have tripled from $198 million to $643 million. Only $3 million of this was actually seized in cooperation with federal authorities. So let, let me get this straight. They're, the asset forfeiture is supposed to go to the schools, but because of this system, they give it to the federal government. The federal government then gives it right back to them, but because it's not coming back through uh, asset right. forfeiture, then it's a different bucket, so right. they can mm-hmm. screw the schools out. That's correct. It's money laundering, Dennis. It's, it's exactly I understood right. the racket. Right? So, yeah. Yeah. Money laundering every, through the federal for every, the police department. Every organized yeah. crime uh, <laughs> It has Associated, yes. United. I just want to understand this the mechanism. This is just, yeah. John Gotti. Every, gover- yeah. John Gotti just Every government is a mob. Yep. If, if you're walking near John Gotti's grave, he's jealous of this right now. Mm-hmm. What would you think, Trisha? Yeah. No, every government is essentially a mob, if you think about it. Uh, just larger governments, especially like an empire like the U.S., are just like a really refined large mob. So... So between 2008 and 2015, $5.3 billion was seized through equitable sharing. Where the burden of proof is higher, equitable sharing payouts increase. In 2009, the federal government paid out $500 million in assets under equitable sharing schemes. This is up 75% from the previous year. And uh, let me go back, excuse me. Uh, In North Carolina, law enforcement agencies get more than $11 million per year through their participation in the federal equitable sharing program, even though the state banned civil asset forfeiture and redirects all forfeiture proceeds into a fund for public schools. So even in a state where you're you're banning it, they're using this program through the feds to get their money. And by the way, the feds aren't just giving the money back for free. What happens they're, they're is they're taking a 20% cut. They're taking a 20% yeah. cut, but then they're also getting the money because the police departments are using that money to buy new tanks right. and military equipment and guns and everything else from yeah. contractors and federal governments and everything else. Exactly right. And the military itself. So let's look at some of the, uh, the laws by state. And if you're innocent, it can be a real challenge to get your property back. Remember that. At the federal level and in 35 states, the burden of proof is on the owner. In five states, it depends on what kind of property was seized. In the remaining states in the District of Columbia, the burden of proof is on the government. In some states, fighting seizure in court means the risk of paying the state's legal fees twice. In half of all states, law enforcement keeps 100% of all forfeited assets. In an additional nine states, 80% or more is retained by law enforcement. Now, proponents say that asset forfeiture stops crime at their roots. If law enforcement officers are able to cut off the tools used to commit a crime, such as a car driven during a drug exchange, then crime rate should decrease, the thinking goes. In practice, though, it has a negligible impact on crime rates and has merely provides a perverse incentive for police to seize as much property as possible in order to fund their departments. The Institute for Justice found that more forfeiture proceeds did not resolve in more solved crimes or less drug use. The study also found that asset forfeiture activity increased in times of local economic stress. So that coming recession, protect your property, don't stop for the police. By comparing crime clearance rates to asset forfeiture revenue, the study found that the impact of forfeiture funds on crime fighting was, at worst, insignificant and, at best, wildly overstated 
For example, the study reported that a $1,000 increase, $1, increase in forfeiture funding per officer would mean solving just 2.4 more crimes per 1,000 uh, reported offensive, uh, offenses. Excuse me. A recent survey of 560 civil asset forfeiture cases in four Texas counties conducted by the Texas Tribune found that half of the cash seizures were for less than $3,000, and 20% of the cases were not accompanied by criminal charges. Another investigation earlier in the year by several South Carolina news outlets reported more than 55% of the time when South Carolina police seized cash, they took less than $1,000. So they're literally beating kids up for their lunch money at this point. Um, a recent analysis of more than 23,000 asset forfeiture cases in Chicago between 2012 and 2017 found the median value was $1,049. Uh, $1, $1, Nearly 1,500 of those seizures were for amounts under $100. So they literally just stop you and say, oh, what do you got in your wallet? And then go on their merry way. I mean, that, that used to be the, the, the bribe to get you out of the crime. Now they just take it because they don't have to worry about they, it and take you to jail. Right. If you say, if you want some of this money in my wallet, then let me go. Then you're going to jail. They don't even have to, you don't just don't say anything. Just hand them your wallet. Yeah. They have no incentive to, to take the bribe now. Right. It's unbelievable. Um, and I, I had first heard about civil asset forfeiture after becoming a libertarian. That's usually when anybody hears about it is after they become mm -hmm. a libertarian. And it must have been around 2011. And I didn't think that could possibly be true. I thought there's no way that the police, because even as a libertarian, you know, oh, you know, 10, 11, you're like, the cops aren't bad. You libertarian, you anarchists. And then you start to like really look into it after Ferguson and you read Rise of the Warrior Cop and you're like, hey, this isn't great. And then, you know, you hear about civil asset forfeiture and you go, holy shit, this is just theft. This is robbery. These people are crooks. Like there's, I, I don't know. When did you first hear about it, Trisha? You probably were just incensed. Yeah, well, I would say, you know, having come from the right, I did have a little police worship for a long time. But um, understanding the mob mentality of police, I think is really important. Um, so if you kind of study maybe uh, like uh, the mobs, uh, maybe during prohibition and stuff, um, you can understand that you, you need to uh, obtain power over people. You need to control their finances. And these are mob tactics. I mean, and it's been used throughout history. So what they're doing is scaring people into giving up their property because these people have, you know, they've, they've got the corner. They have the monopoly on the market. And so, um, you know, if you own a business, if you're your own person and you're driving down the road, well, you need to keep driving down the road, don't you? You need to keep running your business. So what are you going to do? You're going to give in to the mob because if you don't, you're going to be in a cage and can't work. And so when I started to understand that the police are basically mobs that are the arms of the government, then I started to understand that uh, there's no, when you look back into monopoly, there's no recourse for police. You know, it's not like we can take this person's, um, their money or their property and then you know if we did it the wrong way or we didn't we violated their uh, constitutional rights or we broke some certain laws then there'll be recourse there's not recourse the mob doesn't have recourse um and so it doesn't really matter so they just can keep perpetuating this uh and so i know it sounds like i hate the police and honestly i'm gonna say i'm not a big fan but uh yeah. They're basically the mafia, only they have such a larger source of power because they come from government. Remember, in, in places where organized crime had a real strong foothold, crime rates were really low because they didn't put up with that kind of junk, <laughs> right. right? I mean, they did their thing and whatever they, you know, and, and, you know, you could say there was a lot of law breaking going on, but there wasn't a lot of crime. Right. Those are two different things. I think that's really important because I, I, I know that um, as uh, on We Are Libertarians, a lot of people are maybe newer to it. So I think there's, uh, Dennis makes a good point. There's a difference between crime and crime. Um, so crime requires a victim. Otherwise, it's just a poor choice or something you probably shouldn't do, or maybe you should. I don't know. Um, 
uh, so crime requires a victim. And so when you, when you uh, define crime as something without a victim, and that's when you can enforce morality, which never works. Um, and so, you know, uh, I think therein lies a problem. That's pretty philosophical. Maybe that's too much for this. Well, I mean, the or, basic libertarian <laughs> view is people should be free to live their lives as they choose as long as they're not right. violating the rights of others to the same. It's almost word for word out of what Thomas Jefferson said in his first inaugural speech. Right. You know, the government that governs best is one that leads men to. Mm -hmm. uh, that governs the least. Yeah, to, well, to their own. Yeah. You know, you know, take care of themselves, and if they're not harming anyone else, we leave them alone. Basically, right. it's kind of what you said, paraphrasing, but I've got that. It, it, yeah. it wasn't the government. The government that gives its citizens free Hawaiian punch is the government that's the best. That I would think that's what. <laughs> that he, right? that well, was exactly that, it. That was always the underlying right. sentiment. Right? I, I've been to Walmart. Our government gives free Hawaiian punch away. Well, uh, and we just we just had this deification of law and order and police departments over the past. Mm -hmm almost 20 years. I think it's really, it, it kind of started under Reagan. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I mean, before that, I mean, when I was, when I was kind of in my younger ages and we were doing the hippies were out and I was a little, little young to be into the full hate Ashbury scene, but, but you still did Molly and dance naked and hate no, Ashbury. You were just, <laughs> I never made it to San Francisco <laughs> during the time, but um, there was always something about the government and the man and, trying to stand up for our rights and let's have our own little communities and, you know, hippie communes basically is, is what uh, agorists are talking about, you know, volunteerists are, and stuff. It's, it's the same thing, but um, it seemed like as soon as, we, and we almost legalized drugs in this country in the set in the late seventies under, under Carter, it right. almost happened. Really? Mm -hmm. And then Reagan came in and just went the other way with it. Well, so I, I, I have never heard this. What, what was the impetus they for it? They were going to deschedulize it. It was just something that, that Carter believed in, and a lot of people in the society were saying, everybody's smoking pot anyway. I mean, it right. was the 70s. That was, that was the amazing thing about becoming an adult. And, Trisha, I don't know about you, but I grew up, you know, early adulthood. I was in Christian communities and mm -hmm. I was raised in, you know, kind of a sheltered environment in some ways. Uh, drugs were just something that like people did on TV, but I didn't know anybody that d did drugs at all. When I became an adult and granted like adulthood happened while I worked at the libertarian party, I couldn't believe how many people smoked weed. Like it was half the adults that I knew. I mean, it's probably higher now than, than it was. Uh, yeah. I, I would say pe not. people are more comfortable with admitting they do it now too. But um, yeah. yeah, I would definitely say a good 20% of people I know. And uh, well, yeah, when I was growing up, it was, I don't uh, think it's a, I don't think that cannabis, I think it has a lot of uh, great medicinal uses and okay. I would encourage, yeah, I would, huh? I'm just saying I would encourage people to use that over pharmaceuticals for sure. The, the you hear that that's yeah. Jefferson airplane playing in the background of her. Hey. Uh, a little white Pink rabbit, Floyd. baby. <laughs> Floyd. Uh, so no, the I'm so juvenile. I'm like, pothead. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was growing up, I was, um, you know, I kind of spent some time in the city. But I got in the fourth grade, where we moved to the country, and in the country, right. there wasn't really a lot of drug use going on. Right. There was a lot of drinking going on. Right. Um, but I went to college when I was 17. I got to college and was in the, one of my friend's apartments. Um, not too long after getting there. And the first thing they did was just take this big old bong, fire it <laughs> up. And it was just, they spent their whole day like that. <laughs> I'm like, okay, this is different, you know? And then, and then I just living in Chicago at the time, I just kind of got introduced to the whole culture and um, that I was really kind of, he took the hit off his from. first joint. His pupils uh, got big, and then the no, camera did, zoomed into his my, pupils, and then it was Dennis it was, floating through the. I don't think I've ever, no, no, no. Dennis didn't inhale. He didn't, he didn't inhale. Right. He's like Bill Clinton. <laughs> no, I have inhaled, but no, it was a it was a bowl. Okay. My first time, but I never I've never done one of the big like big glass bongs. But how did it feel? What what what? How old were you again? Uh, well, I was 17 when I went to college, but I turned 18 about two months after I was there, a month after I was there. Okay. So I was probably 18. When I... Okay. All right. Did you just get like sleepy or what? I just, it, like, you, no, it's the thing, the thing with me and marijuana, and I don't do it very often at all. I mean, I'm really not a pothead. I've done it 
that four, pineapple shirt four or five times in my life i've that, probably smoked pot. he's wearing a shirt he's wearing an apollo 11 t-shirt and then an, a, a yeah. pineapple button up over this, it this is high fashion <laughs> This, this, I is don't the, smoke, this is the Gen X. I don't smoke weed often. That no, shirt disagrees. Sir. But I, you know, Pineapple Express, right? Um, but and I know people who do smoke a lot. Right. But Harry. <laughs> that's just, a, that's a, I don't yeah. know that Harry's ever smoked weed. No, he, he deserves me, that. He deserves that me, right all now. That, all that really happens is my short-term memory dis, dissipates. Uh -huh. So I'll be watching a TV show and going, okay, what's going on here? Because I don't remember the last what happened five minutes before that, right? <laughs> and I'm just trying to figure it out, especially if you're watching a really freaky movie to begin with. It's a really interesting experience. And then I just, my um, face uh, contorts into a smile. You can't stop it. It's a <laughs> start hurting. And I just laugh. And then I go fall asleep after about an hour of it. That's, that's it. Awesome. That's, that's the extent of what happens when, I'm, when I smoke a joint. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's unbelievable that it's still scheduled in the same right. class federally as heroin it's and it's a much better experience or, than if i drank three beers right you know yeah. which when i drink three beers i do the exact same thing i just kind of do my head like this and get a little fuzzy <laughs> and start laughing a lot but i don't throw up when i'm smoking pot <laughs> i think i'd be an angry drunk what do you think trisha um no i think you'd be ridiculous drunk to really? be honest yes I, I think you would probably sing show tunes do a <laughs> dance I am probably. Tried it. Yeah. The, I, I am so goofy when I'm drinking. Really? It's, people are like, you're so much fun when you're drinking. I'd sing the bishop's mm -hmm. part from Les Mis. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you would come out like full voice tenor. I <laughs> had a dream. So, <laughs> yeah, nothing wrong. And start my, singing. My, the <laughs> my filter completely goes. So I start making really bad jokes. I just <laughs> laugh all the time at everything. That'd be great. It's pretty fun. My my fortieth, my fortieth birthday. My wife threw a surprise birthday party for me, and their goal was to have me wasted as fast <laughs> as possible because they started giving me vodka martinis mm -hmm. the minute I walked in. It was I was just like, oh, this is weird. And she, they'd got a band and everything else it was really cool. What she did, and then um, my my parents were there, so this is the first time my mom and dad seen me <laughs> drunk. And oh no! Literally, literally, they were pouring me pure vodka martinis. That's it wasn't. So like a little bit of vermouth in it. And I think I was plastered at 15, probably 45 minutes in. I was like, just, <laughs> hey, how's it going? <laughs> and I, and I was like that for three hours. That's hilarious. Well, let's move on. <laughs> uh, thank you for sharing your stories here today. Thank you, Dennis. You're a lush. <laughs> Hi, <Fine>. Trish. <laughs> So, I'm a hippie pothead lush. We already discovered this, right? <laughs> how I got anything, how I got a career or anything else is unbelievable. So how are, how are the police viewed today? Let's talk about uh, public sentiment around the police. Uh, there's an extensive Pew study on uh, this in the show notes. Uh, but the American public has increasingly come to view police as warriors and enforcers, not guardians. In fact, almost a third of the public now view their local police as serving an enforcer role instead of a protector role. It's working. Yes. Uh, in, in recent years, the police reform has become a major topic in the U.S. as tensions between citizens and the police have grown, especially after the 2014 killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. President Obama, after a grand jury deciding not to bring charges against the officer who killed Brown, said, quote, understand our police officers put their lives on the line for us every single day. They've got a tough job to do to maintain public safety and hold accountable those who break the law. Uh, critiques of police. Now, I will say that, um, who was I listening to? Rush Limbaugh, actually. Oh, Lord Jesus, Christopher. At some point last month, I heard Limbaugh say, uh, this woman called in and she's like, my husband is a New York, an NYPD officer. And it's, you wouldn't believe it, Rush. He's in Brooklyn and he walks down the street. Ten years ago, they'd salute him because they worshipped them after 9-11. And now they throw things at him and they're horrible to him. And I went, excellent. No, I'm just kidding. I don't, yes, you, you should. Not, you should not throw things at police. You should be polite mm -hmm. to the police just as you should be nice to any human being you see. Human being. Okay. Now listen, that is the human. <laughs> that's what they do. Okay, I'm just messing. I'm just messing. I know she's not at all. 
<laughs> but I don't also go around throwing people in cages for plants. So I'm probably more human. Yeah, but you do shoot the dogs, right? Remember? Right. Well, yeah, you got to do that. I feared for my so, life. But I did think that it, it was uh, interesting and that little anecdote about NY, even in the NYPD after 9-11, you know, almost 20 years after 9-11, it's, it's a tough being a police officer there in New York City. You know what's really funny, too? They're talking about de Blasio yeah, basically about, yeah. like rotting out the reputation of the police. Why, do, why doesn't the fire department have this? Yeah, why? Exactly. Yeah. It's I, have a a unique, I have a unique oh, perspective on that. Go ahead. Um, so I happen to be in a relationship with somebody that does that. Um, what, and the, I've known this. Fires or police? Well, or, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I, I don't share too much push. No, 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 no. I want to know. Is, are you dating a cop? No. Jesus, Lord, Christopher. Do you not know me better than that? I'm not dating anybody that's employed by the state. Okay, so you weren't. So, all right, so you, who were you dating? Like, start the story over. Stop it. Oh, he's going to kill me. <laughs> Is he watching um, you right now? Oh. Uh, no, uh, but I have known people uh, that do this as a profession, a firefighter, um, okay. uh, which uh, a lot of times they can be employed by a private company or by a city or a municipality or whatever. But okay. I think it's Long funny thing. that, um, yeah, um, he has another career, but uh, uh, their cops look at themselves as such larger people than these people, like maybe a paramedic or a firefighter or like a first responder, responder that doesn't carry a badge and a gun. Um, and they're praised so much more. And it's like, you know, those people actually perform a service. Like, I don't remember, like, calling the cops to get me in trouble for anything. But, yeah, I've had people that are ill and I need somebody that has medical training. Or I've had an emergency situation where I need, like, a firefighter to come. And then you think about 9-11. Who are the bravest people? Not the people that have held a monopoly on force with a gun. They were the people that went into a building to try to rescue people and stop a fire. That voluntarily chose. Yes. That's why uh, we honor their sacrifice. That's a hero. Yeah. Right. That's a it, hero. It, nobody was standing there pointing a gun at police officers saying, run up that, those stairs or firefighters run up the stairs. They voluntarily chose to go up and help and save people. And that's that, that voluntary choice, that act of heroism is why we, we honor and celebrate those people. We don't honor and celebrate people who, who voluntarily Ooh. choose. Like I have never, I have never needed paramedics or fire the fire department in my life. Uh, I actually, I think I needed the fire department as a kid because I was watching like Jaws, and I was sitting in the living room and the just the roar of Jaws was intense. And then I look over and I'm like, the fireplace is on fire. Uh, but I, I was a kid, what? and so uh, but as an adult, I've needed the police several times. And you know what they've done? absolutely not a goddamn thing for me yep you know yep. ever they've well, you, every time i've had property stolen they've never helped they've never done anything they're completely useless they don't even show up half the time they, they, they've come four hours later and took a report down and said we can't do anything to help you i, I talked mean, to us have done that i talked to p officers on the phone but i've had plenty of interactions with police officers at traffic stops or you know like if you want to know why the the p profession is under fire most of the interaction that people have with them is as they're collecting revenue. Mm -hmm. And I was almost ticketed today. Fortunately, they got the guy in front of me. I will be slower to work tomorrow because now I know where they're setting the trap. Um, but they almost got my dumb ass twice now. Uh, that is the experience that most people have. And it isn't a, a time when you voluntarily called for help. And mm -hmm. usually, and the amount of people that I have talked to that have called the police for help have not been helped. Right. Domestic violence victims who call because the husband is genuinely outside their window stalking them. And the police officer says in Amanda's story in episode 141, why didn't you shake your boobs at him longer so we could have caught him if he'd stayed out there longer if you'd done that? Jesus, Lord. That's, that's the kind of help that I often hear police officers kind of giving. Um, it, yeah, it, but it, if you call a paramedic or a firefighter, they're going to perform a service for you. <laughs> right. So yeah. it, it, it just, it, if you want to know why the, prof the profession is genuinely, but again, let's go back to it. Why are police officers, yes, they're choosing to go to work every day, but they're, they're being forced by laws into certain situations. Like mm -hmm. 
you, you're telling me that we really need somebody to pull me over for going 10 over the speed limit on the interstate. You're telling me we're, I'm watching cops fly by me every single day on the interstate. It's mm-hmm. a charade. Speed limits are dumb. Okay. I'm gonna, they are. They're stupid. Hey. Everybody has that natural speed that you go that you know is safe. And your natural intuition, your incentive to not die is to slow down. I've always said that the law should be, if they're going to have a law, the law should be, if, are you driving recklessly? Are you driving right. dangerously? Are you tailgating somebody? Are you cutting people off? If you, somebody witnesses you doing that, pull them I, over. I, I Give called, them a big old ticket. I called 911 two weeks ago, and I reported somebody for reckless but, driving on the interstate. He nearly put me in the wall. He was weaving in and out of traffic. He was going 100 miles an hour. He, I almost wrecked at at 80 miles an hour on the interstate because of this guy. So I called in the license plate number. Right. But, uh, Trisha, do you still love me? <laughs> I don't know, Christopher. Like, I, I understand the sentiment. If we had a voluntary society, there would be like a, like a hotline for, to call those people in. Right. The problem is you called the, uh, uh, politi- the politician's arms and on him. So. Well, that's the option I had. And he, was gonna, he almost but, killed me and he was going to kill somebody else. So. But I would say at what Dennis said actually about speed laws, uh, there's a lot. I've read a few studies about um, speeding and how police officers, uh, when they pull somebody over, actually make the situation less safe and more dangerous. Um, and so it's really funny, like if, if say – I don't know, a year and a half ago, I'm driving down uh, 35 and I'm going 42 and a cop swings around the other way, almost cuts the guy off behind me and then comes and steals the money from a single mom that busts her ass so he can take his government welfare check home at night. He's the one who actually made me less safe. I was following the flow of traffic. So actually speed laws have nothing to do with safety, but like somebody weaving in and out of traffic and things like that, I obviously in a voluntary society, you know, those people get pulled over and it's dangerous, I, you know, but uh, I felt, I felt speeding no, is really silly. I felt but, no guilt calling uh, the, the armed enforcers in on that one. I'm, I'm sorry. He was, he was a danger to uh, the hood and drinking his juice. So. Well, yeah, no, no. And I think drunk driving, even right. though it doesn't have necessarily have a victim being pull, uh, pulled over, I think that could be solved through a voluntary society. Yeah. And I think I, I see. I have a problem with drunk driving because people are like, "Well, there's no victim." I'm like, you're making, you're putting yourself in a situation where you don't have complete control of yourself behind the wheel of a dangerous killing machine mm-hmm. that's reckless. Right. Right. You are endangering the public. Uh, there's a victim there. Right. Just because you got lucky and didn't hit somebody doesn't mean you weren't in a position to actually. It's about. It's sure. like going out with a gun. In your back, you know, it, in a crowded street, drunk and just waving it around and randomly shooting. It's the same thing. You may or may not hit somebody, but you're still endangering everyone's life when you do that. Right. So I don't see that as any different. All right. So let's give you a little more uh, detailed information here. So critiques of police are often tempered by assertions that the police provide a necessary peacekeeping force to guard against crime and ensure that criminals are, are brought to justice. In reality, they operate as an armed collection agency, targeting citizens with traffic stops and imposing fines that have become part integral parts of the city's budget. The police, as James Baldwin once put it, are simply the hired enemies of the population. In America, we have made the police the primary problem-solving institution in our society. We profess a moral objection to something, say, sex work or drug use, so we criminalize it and charge the police with stamping it out. Most perceived threats to America's safety, urban gun violence, foreign terrorist attacks, immigrant crime waves, result in fact from American policies or are created wholly out of our imaginations. And I truly believe that once we realize that the government is at the root of so many of our bad ills in society, that it is, it is causing so many ills, and humans realize that they don't truly need the city, state, and government anymore, uh, they will start to reform it. But we're going to have to start swallowing some hard truths. And it begins with the idea that we are asking police to act as these armed collection agencies. Yes, there are a lot of good detectives out there, for instance, that you might see on those TV shows who do solve crimes. There are a lot of cops who do save lives. But there are a lot more people who are out collecting revenue for their local township. Uh, and instead of that LAPD beat cop that you, you, you've seen in, in uh, The Shield or 
on, on SVU. So it, it comes down to the fundamental idea that if you want police relations to be better with the, the public, then stop asking the police to do so much. Stop just having so many negative interactions with the public on a yeah. constant basis. They're not going to see you that way. I, well, I, would, I would argue that a lot of police officers, if you talk to them, feel that they're put in an unwinnable position. And they are. Uh, part of the system is doing that. Which too. is why they're, they're, there's a lot of turnover in the job because they just go, uh, I, I just don't want to do this anymore. I, I, I can't win. Politicians, I just read this uh, great book by a former LAPD cop called Rise of the Servant King. And he talks a lot about how it's like, the, just the incentive structure of it is wrong. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a really good book. But I, I, would, I would add to that. And I think that um, we had touched on earlier, the profession of policing has very much changed. If you look even like statistically at uh, uh, rape, uh, murder, burglary arrests, burglary arrests back in the eighties, as opposed to now, where nonviolent crimes are uh, mostly looked at. I think that um, the incentives in the profession, profession have changed and that there's this super, there's this certain culture around police uh, that has changed and we're, lo we're to look at them as some sort of uh, special class of citizens. They're almost like a special race, which I think is really strange. Um, I think that's evolved over the last maybe like 25 to 30 years. Uh, and I think that has a lot to do with the state. Um, again, I go back to the 2002 Authorization Act where we kind of like gave local police uh, rights and um, privileges that would only be granted to militaries. Uh, and so I think maybe our whole mindset of policing and the police state and then the whole mindset of the police looking uh, for crime and looking not to serve and protect, but to find somebody doing something wrong. I think that's definitely been a huge, that's a huge part of what's wrong with policing in America. I think it has changed dramatically over the last 30 years or so. Okay. So, you know, if nothing else, we are fair and we are libertarians. Everyone says all of the time, we Are Libertarians is so fair. I've never seen a podcast more fair than this. We're going to give uh, the, the police their say. Uh, and like I said, if you, if you are a police officer and listen to this, if you've made it this far into it, uh, send um, me an email because I would love to talk to you. Um, but uh, The Economist did a series of interviews with various police officers around the U.S. And this is what they had to say about their own job. One lieutenant from an urban Midwestern force put it, it sometimes feel like the only voice you ever hear is criticizing you. If you watch the TV news or our good work only gets two seconds. When we do something bad, it gets two minutes. Another officer, this one a veteran from a Northeastern suburban force, says he thinks that the media and the rise of smartphones makes policing look worse than it is. The mm -hmm. 10 seconds you see a man of a man being hit with a baton, it looks horrible, but you don't always know what that man was doing. Any use oh. of looks horrible, even if completely necessary i don't think that this is now you're reacting now there is some justification to that because you don't know exactly what was happening in a lot of these situations trisha is every police action where where they're subduing a, a perpetrator with force is that a bad interaction in your eyes oh i would go to the question of why are they subduing somebody and so I would say probably 99% of the time, uh, it's wrong. What, what is your purpose of subduing this person? Is it worth physically violating somebody to enforce a law that a politician brought down on you? Were they selling uh, cigarettes? Uh, yeah. Who cares? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Who cares? I, I, I don't, I understand why they think that way. I just think that they think improperly. Um, if you are willing to, here I'm going to, here we're trying to be fair on We Are Libertarians, Chris, and I'm going in the opposite direction. So you can just okay. cut it off if you want. Yeah, okay. You say your, whatever you think. Okay. Sometimes I'm not super eloquent, but uh, if That's we are trying to think for. of it, okay, <laughs> sweet, then I fit in. Um, if you think objectively about it, uh, it really doesn't matter what your intentions are. If you are, if you are 
violating somebody's rights and they have not hurt anybody else, you're the bad guy. But what and if you get on tape a, a suspect or a known a person that's committed just a violent crime, for instance, a mass shooter or something, and you have video of a person, let's say they've, they've broken down the door and they're tackling a rapist and it looks violent as they're subduing them and beating them with a baton. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times we do, oh, they're beating the hell out of a, an air sure. gun, for instance. Chris, yeah, Christopher, how many times have you seen one of those videos? I don't sit there and watch all that, like, porn. Like I do. Porn. I do. Right. Um, so, and I want to do, I did want to give a shout out to Polisa Police, uh, yeah, very, a, 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 police a very police. good, yeah. Um, so like, a very good friend of mine runs that. And I think that's super important to everybody go like now, now it's Polisa Police 3.0 because they keep getting shut down. Um, most of the, the videos you see of that are people that are charged with nonviolent crimes or crime, uh, maybe they're violent crimes, but they're not rape, murder or burglary. Um. And so I don't think that anything ever goes viral of a police officer beating the crap out of a rapist. Do you know why it doesn't freaking happen? Do you know statistically the amount of murderers, rapists, and uh, burglar burglaries that uh, have been caught from the 80s to today? There's a huge disproportion to nonviolent crime arrests. Um, so I would challenge anybody listening to this to go find a video of a cop beating the crap out of somebody that actually hurt somebody because you're not going to find it because nobody cares. I also what think that it, that it doesn't go viral because people go, well, he deserved it. But if it's somebody who just got tased for having a taillight out, there's a certain portion of our population that goes, yeah, look at this bullshit. Right. So it goes and, and viral it should. because people are like, hey, look at this. And they keep getting shut down and that's really wrong. But I just... I'm trying to really bite my tongue on this show, Chris, but I just, I don't, okay. I don't have pity for people that prey on other human beings and make a living off of stealing from them. I just don't have a lot of fucking pity for them. Okay. I just don't, I don't do that. Don't do it to me. That's pretty simple. You know, you didn't, you weren't born a cop. You don't have to be one. Maybe I was. You did you just assume my occupation? <laughs> Chris, you'd be the worst cop in the whole world. <laughs> I would. I would. I would hug every criminal. I'd be. Like, Who you would. Me? You'd be like, "Have you been to therapy? Because therapy is really good." <laughs> <laughs> You're just suffering from childhood trauma. That's why. I'm <laughs> yes. <laughs> acting out. <laughs> right. This is your outer child acting out. Let's get in touch with the inner child right now. Put the gun down. Uh, <laughs> I turned gay as I, be I became a cop, and I just yeah. What the hell? What's with this sir, rainbow? Put that down now. <laughs> Chris uh, is the rainbow cop deluxe. You don't have to. You can say whatever you want. Uh, just okay. because I said I was being fair doesn't mean you have to be. Okay. Uh, you're what's called the voice of the listener, or okay. at least the anarchist ones. Um, right. Hey, there's like four of us. Right. So cops think that the public underestimates the threats to their life and why the use of force is sometimes necessary. Mm -hmm. Most of the officers interviewed say that guns poison policing in America, quote, they're literally everywhere, says one. And the problem with dealing with guns is that if I'm talking to you and you've got a gun, action always beats reaction. One female street cop points that having to carry our firearm automatically escalates violent situations. Quote, if I take a punch and I'm knocked out, they could take my gun, she says. We need to stay a step ahead of them, so we sometimes use a higher level of force. That was a point of view that I had never thought about, but it does make sense. And, uh, you know, if, if you're in England, the, the cops don't carry guns because they never had a strong gun culture here in America. Obviously, if you're a police officer in Chicago, you're probably going to want a gun. And uh, they, they probably do think about it differently. Um, Several of the half a dozen cops interviewed argued in one way or another that if people did not resist arrest, somebody hold Trisha back, they would not be hurt by the police officers. If somebody is fighting with the police and they end up getting shot, I guarantee you there is a point where the officer gave lawful orders and you have to stop resisting, says one. Another argues that people need to get used to cops acting forcefully. Quote, I would say that we need to train the public. These cops... A significant minority seem to suggest that the use of force is always justified when people resist arrest or disobey orders. Dennis, you're acting like Trisha. Are you okay after that? 
How do you feel just, about a member of the government train the police? Uh, train the public. Train That's the what, public. Right. Right. Hmm. So, the yeah. Jesus the Christ. Around where <laughs> it states that you know the public is expected to remain calm and do everything they're told perfectly right, right when they've got a gun in their face. But the trained person, if they're encountering somebody with a gun, it's literally or a says. dog. I'm sorry, but that one of the biggest pet peeves of mine is that these brave hero policemen are scared of a chihuahua or a huh. little pit bull or something. They're going to be mauled to death by these dogs. I'm sorry. It's not going to happen. You don't need to be shooting these animals. Um, it, it just, it's kind of infuriating because the police are the ones who are supposed to be able to, are supposed to be trained in how to defuse situations. They're not diffusing anything. Right. I mean, what happened to teaching them how to diffuse situations? Right. As we heard in the last episode, they're not trained. They're rarely trained. Right. And the other thing, too, is that we were reading through the statistics on, um, you know, the perceptions of uh, the police and everything else. But the other thing that goes along with that is that we have lowest crime rates we've had in a long time. Mm -hmm. It's been going down steadily for decades. But if you ask people... 70 to 75 percent of them say that things are worse now than they were three yeah. decades ago right because there's just the mindset and so they're the ones who are letting the police do what they need to do because they feel like there's so much crime out there we have to have these people out there protecting us and who are you to stop them from keeping us safe and think of the children yeah you're literally playing simon says and if you don't play yeah. simon says right you're going to get shot did you ever did either of you ever see the Arizona man sobbing and begging for his life in yes. the hallway of the hotel? Yes. Uh, his name was, we actually covered it here on the show. His name is Daniel Shaver. Um, and he's crawling on his hands and knees, basically begging for his life. And then the, the cops shoot and kill him. Uh, no, they murdered him, Christopher. They murdered him. So, I mean, you, you can watch this video and I really think everybody should. So it, it's, uh, it's, pretty shocking well, there's the men there was a the mentally challenged person that was in the street unarmed sitting and it was shot right um what was it thomas kelly who is a another person who had some mental issues um was beaten to death now he wasn't shot he was actually beaten to death by a bunch of policemen right you know i mean it's and then then you see the canadian police with a guy who's trying to get suicide by cop yeah right He's trying to get suicided that way. And that policeman had a gun, but he stopped, didn't pull it, and diffused the situation and talked him down and got him contained without any violence whatsoever. That's what the training should be leading us to, yeah. is mm -hmm. teaching them how to really interact with those situations. Patricia, anything to yeah, say? I, yeah, I think the training actually, um, so maybe technically the training – tries to show them that but once they get on, onto a department and become part of this brotherhood and this fraternal order um it's quite different and what they're taught is that you're a victim they want to kill you there's a war on cops and you need to be proactive and i think this whole war on cops uh story and a false narrative is part of the huge problem it's patently false um, police officers have one of the least dangerous jobs with one of the best pays for the lowest amount of education. So it is not a super dangerous position. That's completely false. That's a media driven narrative. Uh, I think that the most dangerous profession is to be a logger. I think it's a timber worker. Um, police are about, I think too, yeah, a, I think, yeah, hot police hot. are about 13 down on the list. Um, and so it's actually a very safe profession, uh, if you consider it a profession, which I don't. Uh, and so you drive this, <laughs> you drive this narrative that you're in trouble and then you train cops to think of citizens as enemies. Well, that's a really bad mixture and that's going to produce a horrible cocktail and it has. And, uh, I, I, I don't know it. I think when you say that cops are victims, it's laughable to me, but most of the American public thinks that's true. So, so, uh, so it's a lot of perceptions. That's, and that's what I was trying to say earlier is that the majority of people have misperceptions about a lot of this information. And so yeah. they deify the police. They, they, they won't, mm -hmm. 
don't want to be harmed. They want to, everybody to be safe. And they, they feed into the propaganda they've been fed. And that's mm-hmm. why it still continues. If we were demanding our rights, if we were standing up for ourselves as a majority, they wouldn't be able to get away with any of this. We'd be able to stop it. Yeah. Uh, it's just not the situation right now. So more education is the only thing I can think of. More getting the word out, trying to somehow mm-hmm. change the perceptions in this, in this country for that. Why is it so difficult for a Republican to understand that a person in government, whether it's state or federal or local, might be um, impeding on their rights and might not have their best interests, but at the same time, the arm of the government, which would be locally the police force, they can't understand that. I don't understand how you could think one could take your liberty and the other could not. Well, it's, it's mostly because their opponents think the other way. So yeah. they yeah, it's, it's, the it's opposite of whatever yeah. Yeah, the, tri- yeah. the other tribe says. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, final comment is another problem that officers are often judged according to how many people they arrest, not how many crimes they actually prevent. It's all about numbers now, laments one suburban cop. Does an officer spend two shifts working on a burglary, or does he go out and write 20 speeding tickets? There are a few incentives. There are few incentives for trying to solve problems, explains another. The people who get promotions, the people who get specialized jobs, are the people who get arrests. Uh, so again, it goes back to the, uh, and I would invite everyone to go watch The Wire, the entire series. It's, uh, it's a documentary, basically, on the dysfunction of city governments, and not just Baltimore. I can tell you, as somebody who was heavily uh, involved ar- around city government for a while here in Indianapolis for about a decade, the, all that stuff happens here in Indianapolis, and it's a pretty darn good functioning city compared to Baltimore. Uh, there's even a reverend. Uh, in town with like the same name, <laughs> Stephen Clay, uh, with uh, much worse problems than that Stephen Clay, but very similar problems uh, in addition. So, um, but yeah, the wire kind of shows the the improper incentives, uh, and much like any bureaucracy, the if you try to do the right thing, then you're doing the wrong thing, and if you do the in, uh, unimportant thing, then you're doing the right thing, and it's all about making the politicians look good. The Shield was the same way. Documentary, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> And, and that's, you know, what this LAPD cop in this book talked about. He's like, uh, he went to get a job at a suburban uh, branch and they were like, how many felony arrests did you have? Uh, 40. He had 40 felony arrests. This guy only had 20 in the last year. He goes, no, 40 a month in LA, you know, but, because there's just so much crime. But uh, anyways, so yeah, there's, there's a, a lopsided set of, in, of incentives. And this cop ended up leaving the LAPD because he was, you know, during the riots, after the riots, he was actually like, you know, sweeping criminals up off the street and like trying to like he was arresting murderers. And and basically the politicians took control of the police department after the riots and everything went completely apeshit and upside down at the LA, in LAPD. And basically it was just in traction like you were to do the wrong thing that would make crime worse because the politicians were in charge of the police department at that point. So um, again, it all goes back to just the wrong set of incentives and the wrong ideas. So um, let's do final thoughts on this stuff. Let's start with Reinhold. Go ahead. I was going to say, so can we put together a plan to fix everything? Mm. (laughs) What what would that plan be? I have, I have nothing. This is the best I can do is we are libertarians. Well, I mean, we're we're going to get that too. You're going to say, oh, you, all you do is complain, but you don't provide any solutions. I, used to, have, I used to have great ambition. I have and then I did this <laughs> show and started learning. And then I, all my ambition was like, I can't fix any of this. Yeah. So really, that's the, the problem is that how do you fix that sort of thing? And um, there's a lot of thoughts. There's a lot of people trying to figure out ways to do that. But until the perceptions of the people change, I don't really think you're yeah. going to get anywhere with any of it. Um, and I don't know how to change that. That's the problem. We need uh, money or something. I don't know. Just money and power, just putting out the message and finally getting through to people. Hey, you know, it doesn't need to be this way. I truly do think memes have made an impact, Tricia. Yeah. No, I, I would quite agree. Um, I think always with, with any um, movement, uh, changing people's minds and hearts is primary. I would say there are some groups out there um, – working politically and legislatively that are doing good. Um, I work with uh, 
the coalition to fight the injustice at the county jail here. We've had several deaths, people being held on nonviolent crimes. I just met with a guy from Americans for Prosperity, and they're working at decriminalizing, uh, uh, working at mandatory sentencing and uh, lightening that. So I think there's definitely things we can do. But I think the most important thing is making people understand uh, that they don't have to buy the lie that the uh, mainstream media is selling them. And because you distrust a police officer or a certain situation or a law that they're enforcing, it doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't make you unpatriotic. It doesn't make you, you know, uh, some type of criminal. It's good to be skeptical. Um, and I, I think that if we can get people to the understanding where they're questioning law enforcement's motives, whether they, in the end, feel like it falls on the good side or the bad side, I think that that's where you win because then everything comes out of that. Once you um, question government and, and police are government, that's part of, I don't think people view them as that, but they are. So once you question it, um, and you let go of your preconceived notions, I think that's really important. And I think changing hearts and minds, that's always what it goes back to with libertarianism. Yeah, and I would include the police in that. I think that the best way to change this is through dialogue with both local politicians and local police. Mm -hmm. Instead of trying to make enemies out of them, that's part of why I never really liked the cop block movement, is that they would go out and uh, at least, in, you know, our good friend Maya, uh, would go out and intentionally inflame relations with local police to the point that uh, it really put in jeopardy a local um, nonprofit that she was working with at the time. And, you know, th th that kind of inflammation doesn't actually change anybody's behavior. It only hardens their position and makes them more militarized because mm -hmm. uh, just that's human nature. And, and, and then I contrast that with the what the Free Talk Live guys have done in Keene, and they've had a hard time pe keeping police officers th there employed in Keene because uh, the Free Talk Live guys take them out for coffee and just dialogue with the cops and try and challenge their beliefs, try to understand the police uh, and their, that individual as a human being and why are you doing what you do, what's your motivations, have you ever thought about this, and uh, get a lot of police officers to retire that way. And I think... Um, you start changing it from the inside a little bit because you're challenging the perceptions of local politicians and local police officers and departments. And you're doing it in through positive dialogue as opposed to conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if you're, if you're causing more conflict, then you're not actually being a, a positive for your cause. All right. And I think a, one way that, to look at this too is a great point was made by uh, Cody Johnson on the, um, some more news thing. I know it's a comedy thing, but he made the point of why is media so bad and why are we so polarized? And that's because he, he goes to the point of saying that the local news is dying and the local news mm -hmm. is where we used to have the most balanced right. reporting. And now that there's not that balanced reporting that people go to all the time, you end up with polarized outlets who are just feeding their yeah, constituency, you, right? No, you don't even have that on the local level. Yeah. What you get on the local level here in the 12th largest city, and I'm sure it's like this everywhere, what you get in terms of news on the local level is an anemic newspaper that might print some bulletins, mm -hmm. and then you get Facebook right. and Facebook groups, and it's mm -hmm. just screed. Right. And there's a reason that the journalism is important, and there's an editorial process. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you see it in Facebook groups. Yeah, and it, but it used to be that way. It used to be, you know, 30 years ago when we really had strong local newspapers that weren't beholden to making money. They were just part of the service that was provided, and they understood that. Yeah. Uh, they were making documentaries that they would portray and say, oh, this, this thing happened, and they would put together this big article and story and a documentary on it, and it would get things changed because yeah. people would see that, and they want to take action. Right. But no one's doing that now because they're all dying out because nobody cares about local anymore. They're just going right. to the, to where they're mm -hmm. getting drive news from. Right. Right. So the, the question is, how do you fix that? And that was part of the, the whole comedy spiel on how to do that. But um, there are ways I think we do, but we really need news organizations coming back locally or just not having a profit motive. Yeah. You know, to just to be organizations who are dedicated to providing news and not understanding that they're not going to be out to just try to bake a buck. Yeah. That doesn't sound very libertarian, Dennis. 
that sounds very libertarian. Not having a profit motive? <laughs> profit motive, libertarianism isn't about making money. Libertarianism is about being able to do what you want to do. If you choose to do something voluntarily of your own free will. And, and Dennis, Dennis, what do people want to do as individuals? It depends. Every individual is different. You can't say what every individual wants, right? I, I grew up around hippie communes. What are you, an objectivist? Oh. Right? <laughs> are, you oh, a, are you an I, I am. Listen, I am a little bit. I, I'm a, a student of objectivism. I don't say that that's my philosophy. Because okay, you know, I what think it's happen, really interesting. What would happen if you said you're an objectivist? <laughs> what? Mute. <laughs> <laughs> no. See, you can't even hear her. She is ripping me a new asshole right now. <laughs> she is screaming at me like a typical objectivist. I am not an objectivist. <laughs> Christopher, turn my mic back on. Okay, you're on. Turn you're it back on. on right the fuck now. All right, you're on. All right. I'm not objectivist, but I learned something. A libertarian from that. demanding a microphone oh. she didn't buy. <laughs> right, but I think that's part of the problem, too. I think is a lot of people. How dare? I'm going to kick your ass, Chris. <laughs> fuck off. A lot of Listen here. Think, you're I'm shorter. Gonna you both. I'm you're gonna, shorter. I got the finger going now. You're shorter you in both. person. I can take you. I, I'm not short. Why do you say I'm short? You I'm are short. Six. People. I'm people, five six. No, you're tiny in person. People think that Trisha is very tall, and when you see her in person, you're like, she is tiny. That's because I have an attitude. <laughs> yes. Chris, <laughs> don't call me an objectivist ever again. I'm kicking I, I won't. The, well, yeah. No. I, if you well, are on a date and they say they're an objectivist, run the other way. Well, she said she was a student of objectivism. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, well, I'm a student of Buddhism, but I'm a practicing Christian. It doesn't mean anything. It just means I like knowledge. Come on, Dennis. You're a huge liberal. You can get down with this. He's a Taoist, too. I'm a Taoist. Yeah. Oh, whoa. Oh, oh, yeah. We got yeah. all the religions. We just need well, a few. Well, the Koreans were Taoists. Were they? Yeah. Who? 5,000 years ago. Oh. You read read the the old Taoist articles and well, that, I've been, only been around for twenty nine years, so I wouldn't know Dennis. Some <laughs> <laughs> <All right. gasps> my throat. I hate you so much right now. <laughs> oh man, I love you too. Me <laughs> <laughs> too, babe. <laughs> All right, uh, did it, is everybody done That's saying their final, final thoughts? Thought. Okay, Trisha, your final thoughts for the show. Uh, no, I no, I thought well. Go follow Gingerarchy. Follow me on social media. Go to wearelibertarians.com, of course, because you're listening to the show, but uh, subscribe. Um, I was going to say, uh, no, I, I appreciated the way you approached this. Actually, the show notes were completely awesome. That research was really good. Because um, I don't want to, even as an anarchist, I don't want to give off the uh, uh, feeling that uh, I'm, I hate cops and I'm going to say I dislike them very much. But uh, I don't know. I, I feel a lot of hate, to be honest. Okay, I do. I, I'm going to say I have a extreme dislike for them, but I think that there's a really important point to the fact that you should be able to have a conversation with them. And so uh, I think that's a good starting point. I actually had a couple really uh, cops message me um, on social media and talked about- Answer me, bitch. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, why don't you answer me? I love you. You're beautiful. I hate you. Die. No, that was not the cops. Actually, it was really a really interesting conversation. I'm going to have one guy on uh, Ginger Arky. But uh, so I think that there's definitely a line between, you know, just being like FTP, which I won't say what that means. And then saying, here's why I think what I what I think about the police in America. So uh, I just I want to give uh, make that very clear that I don't advocate violence against police officers. Yes, I have very much disdain and dislike for them, but I also am really willing to have an open dialogue, dialogue with them. And so I appreciate what We Are Libertarians does in that fact. Thank you. And mm -hmm. forget the, the, those, those notes. Who wrote those notes? Sam Schultz. Credit, Sam's just, they were great. Yeah. Isn't Sam great? He yeah. is, um, yes, he makes me sound so much smarter than I am. He... He does a lot of research. He's just really, uh, I have no idea what he looks like. He's not in any of the other Facebook groups. He could be a total plant. I have no idea. I've never met him. I know nothing of him. He just, he just. Are you serious, Chris? I'm dead serious, he yeah. And he turns his <laughs> around so fast. He does it. He him, does all that work. Turns like around so fast. Yeah. And it's like, you know, if you just you get a mic and start your own podcast. You get Shut up, Dennis. <laughs> 
Shut up. No. Ixnay on the uh, podcast page. Yeah, yeah. No, no. He, well, listen, he writes really well, but maybe he just needs the voice to give him charisma. And Absolutely. that's what we're doing, right? Are we doing that? And when you think charisma, you think, you think Chris Spangle. That's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, he's just... He, he I'm does, laughing too hard at that. I know. Thank you. <laughs> um. Yeah, Ryan Nichols of the Brian Nichols Show uh, messaged me. Hey, is uh, are all the show notes in a, an easy to grab location so I can go and read those? I was like, no, because that would take organization. But maybe I'll have Paul <laughs> since he's not doing anything else. I'm having a show with Brian in a couple weeks. So yeah, Brian's awesome. Brian, yeah, uh, he's a smart guy. His show. So yeah. uh, Sam is just one of the many people like uh, like these folks are, like Trisha and Ryan Hold and and Paul and many others. But our patrons always uh, help us do amazing work. I'm excited to see Jason Doolittle next week in, in uh, Texas and Dallas. That's where I'm going. Uh, Craig DaCosta is, has been a great patron for a long time, as has Christy Avery. Uh, and we're excited to have Jeff Bennett along and Ed Brehob as well uh, in the uh, Patreon group. So you guys are great supporters of the show, as are all of our patrons. We thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you to Mitchell... Mike Weintz, Mike Mankiewicz, uh, Mitchell, I'm very sorry. Um, Chris, what the hell? But uh, I talk to him all the time <laughs> over on uh, Twitter. So uh, he can give me shit there for mispronouncing his name. Thanks uh, so much for uh, upping your contribution. Um, we've got a lot of great patrons. I'm actually, you know, we're at the end. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through the $25 and $10. It's going to be a lot of names. But I want to just uh, say thank you to these people by name because all of you guys do such a great job of uh, faithfully contributing to the show through uh, financially and helping support people like uh, our other hosts as well as this show and, and keep things going. Uh, I mentioned Mitchell. Thanks to Andrew Bowman, Paul Jonathan Eads Jr., uh, Stone Aldridge, who helps run the Instagram, Ryan Lindsay, who does a great job of running Wall Reader. Go check that out at wallreader.com. Liberty Memes, yes, that Liberty Memes is a $25 a month supporter. Ray Wolf, Mario E, Rob Place, Ryan Hold, thank you for being a $25 a month contributor. Uh, Catherine Iverson, Richard, The Liberty Extract, Michael Schulteis, Joshua Sexton, Jacob Klingensmith, Rick Irvine, Carly Ernst, Brandon Kester, uh, Dan Dunbar, Christopher Brokoff, and uh, Todd Singer. Thank you guys so much for being $25 a month contributors. And at the $10 level, I want to thank Spencer Nelson, uh, Jessica, Miranda Keller, Nick Economopoulos, Chris Lane, Jim Gratner, Hody Johns, our man. He will be back. He's just having computer problems. He's not uh, fled the scene. Uh, William White, Joe Kubinski, Zach Ripple, Don McClellan, Hadley, uh, sorry, uh, the cat is in the way, uh, Hadley Bo Boz Fisher, Jordan Laycock, Brian Littleton, Brian Litton, excuse me, Shane, uh, Ryan Roberson, uh, Aven you know what? I've even asked her how to pronounce this. I'm so sorry. A Virginia Mac. Oh God. <laughs> I know. I'm, oh, I am so bad at pronouncing it. Logan, <laughs> Der Logan Noll, Derek Scott, Michael Eugene Rowe, Toby Stoltzfus, Albert Rockaway, man, he's going to give me shit too because I talk to Al on uh, Twitter all the time. Tom Howd, Mark English, Chris Murray, Samuel Alexander, Chris Bartline, James Darling, Ryan Clancy, and Rebecca Cash. You guys are all fantastic. And we have many different uh, $5 folks. I'm not going to read all of your names, but we do appreciate that. And I just, uh, I'm very thankful for everybody that contributes to We Are Libertarians in a, in a multitude of ways. Um, it, it really keeps me going and I've been doing this for almost eight, nine years now. <laughs> um, uh, oh man, what? So 2012, yeah. March of 2012, mm -hmm. uh, so almost eight. Yeah. Well, so, that's, that's when you'd been to this podcast, but you were doing a podcast before that. I was even. the Libertarian yeah. Party of Indiana podcast. I've been doing this for 10 Friday. years now. So over 10 years I've been podcasting. Uh, and uh, also do Leaders and Legends, a, pro a project I'm really proud of. I've produced that. And then uh, the Pat Down, the, the comedy podcast, which, Trisha, I know you listen to the Pat Down. Yeah, I love it, and I'm so excited to see Miss Pat in Cincinnati next month. 
I may actually be opening that show. I know. I'm going to heckle the shit out of you. Oh, great. So uh, <laughs> I may do stand-up for the first time. We'll see. Uh, so, yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm thankful to everybody who keeps us going uh, because after seven years, seven and a half years, I'm tired. And uh, you guys all really help keep this thing going. So thanks so much to everybody that listens. Uh, like I said, I will be out of town next week. Uh, so that's why we got that second one in last week for you. So you won't be too lonely. But you'll have Ginger Arky and our other podcasts, which you can find out where your libertarians to keep you tided, tied over. So uh, we'll see you in October. Thanks for listening.